Welcome to the 2019 webinar for um, National Science Olympiad Astronomy Division C. This year the topic is stellar evolution in normal and starburst galaxies. Uh, as always, we are supported by NASA's Universe of Learning in a partnership with the Chandra X-ray Observatory and National Science Olympiad. Uh, you can see their websites are accessible here. And this webinar will be posted on the Chandra website at the link there. Uh, webinars from past years are also posted if you wish to see them. So the rules for this year, uh, they're much the same as last year. The topic has changed, as we said, it is now stellar evolution in normal and starburst galaxies. Um, the event parameters are pretty much the same as always. Two computers, two binders, or one of each. Uh, the only change is that teams may be accessing a dedicated NASA database. Uh, and this has to do with JS9. Um, so that will also potentially be a component of the event this year. There have also been topics added to um, the topics list. Uh, you can see them, they're highlighted in red. Those are changes from last year. And also minor changes to the mathematical portion. Um, it's basically the addition of Hubble's law and the tully fisher relationship, which are more related to galaxies. And of course, there is as well a new DSO list, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the big topic for this year, as always, is stellar evolution. And you can see the familiar diagram up there that we use every year. Um, and the fact that this year that we're focusing on stellar evolution in galaxies means that we're kind of covering all of that image uh, because on the large scale, we have to worry about both the massive stars and the low mass stars and together how they affect the galaxy. Um, and so we'll be looking at things from all over the HR diagram, as you can see there on the right, and also looking at how those things will change over the course of time. Um, down there on the right is a HR diagram of a globular cluster, and you can see how those stars have evolved over time. And in galaxies, that large scale kind of evolution is what we'll be looking at. And as I said, galaxies, so they're classified based on shape. This is the Hubble tuning fork. It's a convention for uh, classifying galaxies and it's useful for a quick um, description of what a galaxy is, whether it's spiral or whether it's elliptical. And as well, um, what will be important is also the parts of a galaxy, as you can see there on the right, the bulge in the middle, and then for spiral galaxies, the disk, and also the halo of stars that surrounds it. So this is the DSO list for this year. Um, there's a lot of overlap in these categories. This is just where I felt was the most immediately relevant category for them to be in at a first glance. So we have compact objects, uh, we have SN 2014J, which is a type 1 supernova. We also have NGC 4993, which is a, uh, it's related to a kilonova or a binary star merger, binary neutron star merger, excuse me. And also 47 Jacane slash X9, which is a globular cluster and an X-ray source contained within. And then we have a couple more sources that are related to supermassive black holes. Sagittarius A star, the galaxy cluster Abel 400, and the Chandra Deep Field South. Um, moving on to interacting galaxies, we have the antennae galaxies, M51, the Whirlpool, and its neighbor NGC 5195, uh, the pair M81 and M82, as well as ESO 137001. And for starburst galaxies, lastly, we have IC10, Messi 100, Sene, the Phoenix Cluster, and SPT 034652. Um, so we'll go into those in a bit more depth. So this is SN 2014J, our first DSO. As I said, it's a type 1A supernova that occurred in the nearby galaxy M82. This is actually the closest type 1A supernova in over 40 years, which meant that it's been extensively studied as a result of both how close it is and how recent it was. And an unusual thing about the supernova is the fact that it is unusual, because type 1As are generally meant to be standard candles with known properties, 
but the supernova and other type 1As show that this is not always the case. So this supernova had a fairly fast rise to maximum brightness, faster than expected for a type 1A. And as well, there were no X-rays emitted from this blast, uh, so there was little material nearby for the blast to collide with. And you can see near the center of M82, you might just be able to see supernova blinking on and off in these two images. Uh, next we have NGC 4993. This is a elliptical or lenticular galaxy. Uh, you can see it in the bottom right there. It's fairly featureless. Um, so the reason this is a particularly interesting galaxy to us is because it was the host galaxy of a gravitational wave signal. GW170817, uh, which happened just about a year ago in August of 2017. So this gravitational wave signal came from a kilonova or a merger of binary neutron stars. And so what made this a particularly special event was the fact that this event was detected both in gravitational waves as well as in electromagnetic and magnetic observations. So it was observed from initially as a gamma ray burst, and then as time went on, it was observed in both the optical, the X-ray, the radio, pretty much every EM wavelength. And so this is what's called a multi-messenger event, is that it was observed in both light and gravitational waves. Uh, next we have 47 Tukane, which is a globular cluster in the Milky Way. Um, you can see it there in the, in the top. Uh, it's primarily old and low-mass stars in a very tight concentration, and there are also a lot of X-ray sources in this particular globular cluster, specifically. Um, so one of these X-ray sources is what's called X9. It's a low-mass X-ray binary, which means that there is some kind of compact object, either a neutron star or, or a black hole, and then there's something that is donating matter to it. In this case, um, it's theorized that this is actually a white dwarf, and that these two objects are in very, very close uh, orbit, and so the X-rays are actually from material from the white dwarf that is being pulled into the cellular mass black hole. Uh, moving on to our first of the supermassive black holes, uh, this is Sagittarius A star. Uh, this is the radio source that corresponds to the Milky Way supermassive black hole. Uh, since we can't actually observe the black hole itself, this is the, the closest that we can get. And the reason it's considered a radio source, and that's what it's named after, is that you can't see anything close to the center of the galaxy in visible light, as there's too much dust that causes extinction. Um, and we think this is a fairly typical for a quiet supermassive black hole. Uh, so there have been multiple observations, many, many observations done of this black hole. Um, its mass has been determined by the orbits of its nearby stars. Um, and we've also observed that most of the material that falls into this black hole actually ends up ejected, not consumed by the black hole itself. And as well, there have been many flares and outbursts from it that have allowed us to to approximate what we think the typical supermassive black hole is like. Uh, moving on to our next DSO, this is ABEL 400. It's a galaxy cluster. Um, and you can see there in the X-ray image from Chandra that it's permeated with very diffuse, but also very, very hot intergalactic gas, which glows in X-ray. And that's all the blue that you see in that image there. Um, this galaxy cluster contains what's called a, a dumbbell galaxy, which is NGC 1128, um, down in the lower left there. This is actually two merging galaxies, and the supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies will eventually merge as well. And you can see from the radio source uh, 3C90, uh, 3C75 sorry, that these two are actually gravitationally bound and the distortion of the radio jets comes as they move together through this diffuse intergalactic gas. Um, for the last of our supermassive black hole-related DSOs, this is the Chandra Deep Field South. Um, it's basically just a very deep image taken by Chandra with over 7 billion seconds of observation time. And this is designed to look at the early extra universe, basically to stare at one region of space for as long as possible to see as dim objects as we can. Um, and for the Chandra Deep Field South, 
one of the things that's come out of it is a lot of the study of the formation and growth of young supermassive black holes. This looks back quite a ways to the beginning of the universe. And so we can see how in the past these supermassive black holes have developed along with their galaxies. And what we find is that they might not always grow in sync with their galaxies. In fact, they might grow in bursts instead of in just a slow accretion of matter. Um, and so there have been over 5,000 supermassive black hole candidates observed in the deep field south, as well as some X-ray transients, which we think might be gamma ray bursts. So it's a very good, um, it's a very good image for just looking back at the early universe. The first of our interacting galaxies is the antennae galaxies. Most of you have probably seen this image before. It's a pretty famous image. Um, so. These are two galaxies that are currently in the middle of colliding with each other. It's thought that they used to be spirals before they got distorted by their gravitational interactions. And you can see both in the upper right and also in the infrared, the red image on the left there, that there's a burst of star formation that's going on. And it's thought that this comes from the compression of gas as these two galaxies interact gravitationally with each other. And in the bottom image there, you can also see long tidal tails that have been thrown out as stars have been basically flung out from the core of the galaxy by the gravitational interaction. So this is a very, very good example of what happens when two galaxies collide head on. Uh, we also have M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and its nearby neighbor, which you can see as the bright glow to its, to its right there, uh, NGC 5195. So, M51 is what's called a grand design spiral, which means that we can clearly see the spiral arms winding through it, and uh, its partner is an irregular dwarf galaxy. These two galaxies aren't colliding with each other. Um, you can see that neither of them are anywhere near as distorted as the antennae. These are just passing close by to each other, but they're passing close enough that the gravitational interaction between them is still enough to compress gas and trigger a bunch of star formation in M51 spiral arms. Another thing to note about this is what's called feedback in NGC 5195. This is when the supermassive black hole at the middle of the galaxy affects the galaxy itself. Uh, this is what's called feedback. Um, and so what we see in this galaxy here is we see the hot gas that comes out of, out of the supermassive black hole actually sweeping up some of the colder gas around it and you can see that there's X-ray arcs corresponding to these waves of hot gas. Now we also have M81, M82. This is also a pair of galaxies. Um, these are two spiral galaxies. It doesn't look like it, but M82 is technically a spiral. It's just much more distorted than M81. And so these are also two interacting galaxies that are causing starbursts. But so the starburst is happening in the core of M82. Um, you can see that there on the, on the right. And what's also happening is that because so many young stars are being formed, especially young massive stars, their stellar winds are combining to form what's called a galactic super wind that's actually blasting dust and gas off the galaxy, which you can actually see in the red there on the right. Um, Meanwhile, in M81, there's some star formation in the spiral arms, but there's not much in the center bulge. Um, in the infrared image on the bottom there, you can see that most of, most of the strong emission is from the spiral arms of the galaxy itself. 